All right, welcome to Speak For Yourself. I'm Jason Whitlock. That's Marcellus Wiley, that dude. Sir. Coming up, we'll tell you if Brett Favre should be the Packers' next, next head coach. And if the Steelers will bounce back this week against the Patriots. But we start every day with a win log. So what you got today, Big Dog? Oh, we're going to break down the Hunter Henry uh, matchup with Derek Johnson. No, we're not. No, we're not. <laughs> Stop. Tonight's Chargers Chiefs game <laughs> looks perfect on paper. Both teams come into the contest with sparkling records, big time quarterbacks, receivers, and tight ends, big name pass rushers. Control of the AFC West and home field advantage are potentially on the line. Marcellus, yes, sir. You know them stakes is high. Oh, you went <laughs> de la soul on them, huh? Ah, uh, but here's the truth from the smartest man in football, Fox Sports One's very own Jason Whitlock. You know they call me the <laughs> Foot Fox because you shouldn't believe anything about football until I show you the foot facts. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and the facts is, the Chargers have no shot tonight, none. Mm. This game is far better on paper than in reality. This game is a lot like that perfect-looking man or woman you pass in Whole Foods. Mm. You know, the one standing in the smoothie line in yoga pants. Yeah. You're convinced she would transform your whole life. Yeah. You make small talk, get the name and the digits. <laughs> then you get the SoFax. SoFax is like Carfax. It's a social media report that tracks your activity, mileage, and authenticity. You run his or her name through the social media, and you see the clout chasing selfies, mm. the bottle popping selfies, Lord. the unexplained trips to Dubai and Vegas. <laughs> what once looked perfect on paper upon closer inspection isn't quite so appealing. It's really a fun and done. That's what we have tonight mm. when the Chargers play the Chiefs inside Arrowhead Stadium. This game is gonna be fun for three quarters. Phillip Rivers and Patrick Mahomes will thrill us, but Kansas City is gonna win by double digits. Kansas City is going to beat the Chargers for the 10th straight time. It's a bad matchup, Marcellus. The Chiefs and the Chargers are not equally yoked. Oh, you're going biblical on them. Mahomes, Andy Reid, and the Chiefs are truly elite this year. Rivers, Anthony Lynn, and the Chargers are not. They had a chance to be on paper. The Chargers had a chance to be the most complete team in football. They have an explosive <laughs> offense and a defense that features the second-best pass rushing tandem in football with Joey Bosa and Melvin Ingram. On the back end, the Chargers had the best cornerback trio in the game. Desmond King is the league's best nickel corner. Rookie safety Derwin James reminds everyone of a young Ed Reed. But the reality is Joey Bosa isn't 100% recovered from the foot injury that sidelined him the first half of the season. Don't be fooled by the four sacks in four games. Bosa is a shell of himself right now. He's not the consistent disruptor force we saw last year. The guy you absolutely had to double team. And Melvin Ingram has taken a major step back. He has just five and a half sacks this season. He's been average. A year ago, the Chargers had the fifth best pass rush in the NFL. This year, they're 20th. It's not good enough against the magic man, Patrick Mahomes. This is going to be a one <clears throat> possession game going into the fourth quarter. And then Patrick Mahomes is going to do what Patrick Mahomes does, and the Chiefs win by 12 to 14 points. Those are the foot facts brought to you by the smartest football man at Fox, Jason Whitlock. All right, joining the desk now, football greats, Greg Jennings and Seth Joyner. Marcellus, I'll start with you. Your Chargers have no chance tonight. Mm, you messing nah. with my money right now. <laughs> <laughs> my Chargers. Damn right. Uh, it's going to be a tough one. It's an uphill battle. Uh, they have a chance, uh, but it's going to be a psychological game that they're playing, and it's not based just on the scoreboard or the win and loss. Let me break this one down. This is a team going on the road in a short week, Thursday night game. We know how they usually fare. They lose. Add to that, this team is beat up, especially at the running back position. Very difficult. Going to put all of the stress on this passing game and Phillip Rivers, who's having an MVP season. I'm looking at this as one of those psychological games that we saw the New York Giants play against the New England Patriots in their Super Bowl quest. Remember, it was week 17. What was that, 2007? Uh, going against a perfect Patriot team. And the Giants lost that game, 38-35. And everybody was like, oh, man. And then you know what the Giants players were saying? I remember post-game press conference. Oh, if we could see them again. Oh, if we could do this again. Remember, uh, we've only seen it twice in a year where a team has won three games against the same team and won the Super Bowl. 
you rooting for Kansas City. You should be rooting against Kansas City <laughs> because the Chargers going to see Kansas City again. And I don't want to play with the odds that only two teams in history uh, since 86 and, and 2008 have won three straight games on the road to a Super Bowl championship. So if Kansas City beats my Chargers again, what's the odds they're going to beat them again the third time in the playoffs? Beating them nine straight, Marcellus. Ten counting tonight. I said playoffs. <laughs> I know what I'm saying. I'm using this as a mind uh. game. We're doing some Jedi mind tricks out there for the Chargers. We may lose this one. We're going to gain great confidence and great intel against you and beat you when it counts postseason. I think that, um, listen, tides always have to change. You ain't going to be the team forever, and that record ain't going to stand forever. Mm. As I looked at the Kansas City Chiefs last week, I seen them struggle a little bit. They had to have some theatrics at the end of the game to actually pull the game out. And I think we are beginning to see the beginnings of, A, great defenses, figure out how to, how to thwart this offense. And I think we're also seeing the beginning of how much they actually miss. Kareem Hunt in this in this offense. Mm. Defensively, listen, the Chiefs aren't that good, man. <laughs> I mean, you look Probably at them, they're, they're, they're ranked 30th. So, Phillip Rivers is going to get his. You can count on that. The question is going to be is whether this defense can step up and find a way to not to, to, to minimize Patrick Mahomes and what he's doing. And you got a Tyreek Hill that's coming into this game that's limping. You know, you know, back old, in old school, first thing I would have did was, you know, first thing we would have did, we would have stepped on that. You got to step on that foot. <laughs> How right, that foot feel? Right, right, right out, right out the gate. You right. know, but if that guy can't be what he's what he's been through the first 13, 14 weeks of the season, you know, the the, the Chargers are set up perfect to go in there and get this win tonight. Mm. I like the Chargers. I don't like them to win, but I think they have a chance to win, but they can't beat themselves. And when you look at this nine, these last nine games, that's exactly what they've done. 18 takeaways to four when you look at the Kansas City Chiefs versus the Los Angeles Chargers. Seven of the nine, they've won the Kansas City Chiefs, the turnover battle. They've beat them all these games, and they, they constantly give you extra possessions. When you look at this Kansas City Chiefs offense, Tell me, do they need more possessions? No. Absolutely not. And you look at the Los Angeles Chargers, what do they do? They give the ball away, number one in giveaways. And we talk about the Kansas City Chiefs defense and the lack thereof when it comes to total defense, but they take that ball away. They create turnovers. They give their offensive, their offensive guys extra possessions. And if the Chargers have any chance to go on the arrowhead and win, they can't turn the ball away. You're aware of it. And if you're aware of it, and I'm aware of it, and this whole panel is aware of it, you don't think that Anthony Lynn is aware of that? That's going to be a major talking point for this team. Listen, we're on the road. The worst thing we can do is go out on the road and turn the ball over. It will be a point of emphasis in situational football all week long that they make sure that they lock in on that and make sure that they don't the, turn the ball over. The key to beating the Chiefs is to break their offensive serve several times. Mm -hmm. And that's why Baltimore had a chance. Yeah. They put them in some third and long situations. Hell, they put them in two fourth down situations at the game, couldn't get it done. But they had a chance to break their serve. And I, I'm sitting here talking to two guys that got paid for getting after the quarterback and creating third and long situations. The issue with the Chargers, Marcel, is Bosa <clears throat> is out there playing and he's made some plays, yeah. but he's not the same <clears throat> Joey Bosa. And then if you look at the entire season, Melvin Ingram, to me, has taken a step back. And that, to me, those two guys, if they were back doing what they did last year, 100% and getting after the quarterback, I would think San Diego could win this game because they would break serve several times. Though Bosa Ingram aren't the same, Patrick Mahomes will eventually eat them up. Timing is everything. And everything you just said, all those comments, put them in a bag and, and tie it up because – Ingram's not the same because he didn't have Bosa most of the year, right? And Bosa's not the same because he's playing himself into shape and into that confidence and still making plays here and there, but not the same disruptive force. What's going to happen? You're finally going to have these forces meet, like Voltron, right when it matters. So go ahead and win tonight against Kansas City. Go ahead and win another <laughs> Oh, one. I got you. Uh, yeah, you know what I'm saying. And then in that postseason, something about being against that same team and you know that personnel and you know their greatness, but you didn't experience it this year. You're like, Melvin Ingram took a step back. We played both, so he wasn't the same either. 
but then they're going to meet with combined electricity in the postseason because this is just a prelude once again to what we're really gearing up for. That's why I don't think the Chargers win this game, but they may win the war because they're starting to get the intel and confidence they need to beat this See, I, offense. I'm, I'm, I'm more of an X's and O's guy. And when I look at the dynamics of this game, you know, you got Tyreek Hill is not 100%. So he and Kelsey are the biggest two factors on this team. Yeah. Okay? So now, well, if, if outside of yeah, Patrick Mahomes, Mahomes well, outside of Patrick, I'm talking about yeah, his, yeah. as far as his weapons are concerned. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay? If you don't have Hill 100%, then that allows you to use some assets to make sure that, that Kelsey don't get off. Okay? Now, how do you. I want to be clear, though, Seth, just so we're on the record. That play, that fourth down play, Tyree Hill against Baltimore wasn't healthy. Exactly. Yeah, I, I get his weight game. on that. I get it. <laughs> he don't got to be 100% <laughs> to make let, an impact. But, but let me let me say this. <laughs> Tyreek Hill didn't make the play so much as as Patrick well, was Mahomes. A he was open. <laughs> well, he I, outran two He went to go Listen, get it. <laughs> he, went, he went and got it. No, he threw it to him. He threw it to him because you know what the defender was doing? The defender was sitting back there eating popcorn, looking at Patrick Mahomes running around instead of plastering the guy when the when the quarterback starts to scramble. That's a defensive. You know why hard, he couldn't it's plaster? a hard thing to cover when you constantly yeah, have to on, cover man. for six, seven I mean, seconds. Listen, yeah. I, but you, he's standing right there. If he stopped looking at the quarterback and look Not at the guy to, that's in no, his that's zone. No, a defensive mistake. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. But Tyree Hill will make plays tonight on Thursday night football. No, no yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. But, but, you, but but the key the key to the key to being able to, to keep Patrick Mahomes under wraps is that he makes the majority of his big, big plays out of the pocket. And I see too many defenses that are undisciplined from the standpoint. Listen, if you know that this guy got wheels, you can't let him out of the pocket. Mm. If you got to spy him, spy him. Do, do the, the, the fundamental things to make him play the game at all times from the pocket. And if you don't play it from the pocket, then he's on his back. It's one thing to say it and, and to preach it throughout the week preparation, but it's another thing to execute that. Every team that they face this year sees the same, <laughs> the same thing. Have they been able to do it? No. And one thing Brett Favre told me when I was a young player, he said, and I was hurt, I was injured, I was debating on wh whether I was going to play or not. He said, Greg, 80% of you is better than 100% of most players. 80% mm. or 75% of Tyreek Hill is still faster than almost 100% of players. Yeah. Like, so he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna be effective yeah. regardless, reg just because he's out there. That's the kind of impact And that's he interesting has. you said Derwin James because when they saw each other in the first matchup, that was Derwin James' first game in the NFL. Derwin James is defensive rookie of the year. And to your point about Patrick Mahomes outside the pocket versus inside the pocket, this is amazing. He has almost 1,100 yards outside the pocket. Second place in the NFL is Russell Wilson with half of that. It, when he gets out the pocket, it's an entirely different offense. Therefore, it's an entirely different defensive perspective you have because you haven't seen that type of playmaker outside the tackle box. I, I, I get that point, and, and I hear you. And I hear the, the offensive bent side, you know, that's coming from this wide <laughs> oh, receiver yeah. over He's here. It too. Okay? But the thing that I know is that you can give me a top-shelf defense, still, even though we've tried to change the narrative about offenses and defense and how the game is being played, give me a top-flight defense over a top-flight offense any day of the week and give me a defensive coordinator that understands the importance of the fundamentals of the game and making sure if my defensive ends get up the field three, three and a half yards, shut it down. OK, because you can't get above the quarterback and create that gap between the, 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 the tackle. So you're going to have to do some you're going to have to do some some spying. You're going to have to do some unconventional things. You got to put pressure on Patrick Mahomes. You cannot let him sit back there. You cannot let him run wild. And good defenses and good defensive mm. coordinators understand that. Sounds good. I, I'm gonna, it does. Sound good. Okay. You sound I'm so gonna give, I'm going to give you credit. I'm going to see y'all tomorrow. I, 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 wait, he no, give no, me credit. No, I'm going to give you credit, credit for real because I really I like my point of view about tonight's game. Oh, yeah. You've changed the conversation, giving me something to think about, because I agree with you. I think a month from now, there's more growth that can be had for the Los Angeles Chargers yeah. because they do need Bosa all the way healthy. You got their rookie big play safe, uh, playmaker, safety, who will be better. The only thing I'll say is I think Eric Berry is playing tonight, oh, yes. and that'll be a huge addition for the Kansas City Chiefs tonight and moving forward. UFC featherweight Brian Ortega loves the fight, loves the strategy, and you know what else he loves? 
Toyo Tires. Because like Ortega, Toyo Tires are as tough as they come, and they are the official tire of the UFC. There's a lot to love about Toyo Tires. Aggressive design, proven on and off-road capabilities, tires for any weather, and the toughness to back it all up. There's a confidence that comes with tough tires. So no matter what you're driving, no matter where you're driving, you can count on Toyo Tires. Tough people love tough tires. If you're tough, these are the tires for you. Toyo Tires. The next time you need tires, ask for Toyo, the official tire of the UFC. Learn more at toyotires.com backslash UFC. Time for a big story, Whitlock and Wally. Greg Jennings and Seth Joyner are here. Let's return to tonight's game where Andy Reid and the Chiefs can lock up the AFC West at a first round bye tonight with a win over the Chargers. This year's Chiefs might be Reid's best team ever, but the coach's reputation as a guy who can't win in the postseason and poor clock management still has people doubting how far Kansas City can go. But since 2000, Reid actually has the second most postseason wins of any coach, <coughs> far behind Bill Belichick, but ahead of some of the league's other top coaches. Marcellus is a huge Andy Reid guy. Huge. So I'm going to turn it over to you the way you turned over to me. What you got, big dog? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, I need some video graphics to go with my uh, Wiley log. But um, yeah. in all respect to Andy Reid, uh, I think he's a victim of us moving the goalposts. Um, I, I know for every single player out there, obviously, in terms of playing the team game, a championship is the goal. Uh, many of us fall short of that same goal. In the coaching ranks, you want to win a championship. If Andy Reid and the Chiefs win a championship this year, this conversation is null and void. We get it. However, he hasn't won a championship just yet. But I'm not going to move the goalposts because I respect him in terms of always giving his team a chance to win that same championship. Let's talk about the eighth most winningest head coach we have in NFL history. Eighth. Like, seven dudes could say, I took a team and had more success with them outside of the championship scope than Andy Reid. You look at Andy Reid, this is a guy who goes to Kansas City. They're a 2-14 and 14 bunch. He goes out there, and now they are one of the Super Bowl contenders and have been to the playoffs five or six years. Uh, you look at Andy Reid, five NFC championship games and the one Super Bowl appearance, when everyone said, you give him a receiver out there in Philadelphia, he's going to make the Super Bowl and win it. And if Terrell Owens didn't have the broken leg and still went out there on one leg and Bo diggled it, boy, he was out there balling, still came up short. I look at Andy Reid as this. This is a coach who gives every player a chance to win it all. These are the same darts we shot at Peyton Manning. Oh, how many championships does he have? We're shooting him at Aaron Rodgers. How many championships does he have? Are we going to talk about greatness? We're going to talk about how you are doing your job and giving everyone the potential to be in that position? Or are we going to move the goalposts once again and respect only Super Bowl winning coaches? If that's the case, all right, well, Bill Cowher, John Gruden, uh, they're all better than, than, than Andy Reid. And I, I, look, to me, Andy Reid is somewhere between Marv Levy and Marty Schottenheimer in terms of what the people think. But in terms of what I think, by putting them in that same position, Marv Levy's a Hall of Fame coach. Andy Reid should be regarded in the same scope. Out of 20 seasons, Marcellus. Yes. Uh, there's only five. Dan Reeves, 23 seasons. Chuck Knox, 22. Jeff Fisher, 22. Marty Schottenheimer, 21. Coaches with the longest tenure without winning an NFL title. He's on that list. Yeah. Those four guys ahead of him aren't in the Hall of Fame, aren't Hall of Fame coaches. He, the record speaks for itself. His clock management's poor. He, he, I like Andy Reid. Love what he's done with the Kansas City Chiefs. Do I trust him in big spots? No. Mm. I, I, I trust Andy Reid. I just think a lot of it has to do with what he's had to work with, specifically at the quarterback position. Outside of Donovan McNabb, you're talking about Alex Smith, a guy who doesn't ad-lib. He's, he's very robotic, very high skill set, high talent, but he's not going to give you that flash, that wow, that extra that a guy like Patrick Mahomes now can afford you. So when the, when the fire is at its peak, 
I have somebody that doesn't care because he is just as hot as the fire that he's entering into. And so when I look at Andy Reid, then I look at the guy underneath him, Mike McCarthy. Why does Mike McCarthy get such a bad rap? Because of what he's had at the quarterback position and what he hasn't been able to accomplish. Even though he has a championship, yeah, yeah. he only has one, and we hold them to what he's been having the luxury of having at that position. Now he has a guy that we all feel like he can roll with. Mm -hmm. And now if he continues to have these same failures in the postseason and not win it all, then I think we have a case. But up until this point, he's had to deal with la lackluster play at the quarterback. Today. I don't know. We, my point is we don't – we're not questioning whether Andy Reid is a good football coach. I think, you know, that goes without saying. Mm -hmm. He's one of the best football coaches in the history of the game. Coaches, at the end of the day, are measured by what they do in the postseason. Plain and simple. You know, listen, I mean, he took five teams. He took five times he took a team to the NFC Championship. Got to the championship one time and lost. Okay, so that's not the debate. Does he get a bad rap? No, because you got to finish. You got to close. That's, that's all it comes down to at the end of the day. All right. Okay. And, and, and that's and all, that, though? Well, Gary Kubiak is a better coach. I mean, he that's, won it all. Barry Switzer. I mean, we could go down that list of people who've won it all and they finished it, but then well, you gotta look at body of work. No, 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 but, but I'm, not, I'm not disputing the, his body of work. I agree he's a great coach. But the, but saying that he has a bad rap because he can't get it finished, no, he no he he's not getting a bad rap. That's a fact. The, and, Mar and Seth, you're right on point because the question is, does Andy Reid get a bad rap? Yes. Not whether he's better than Barry Switzer or Gary Kubiak or any of these other guys. He gets the rap he's earned. He's he struggles in the postseason. And the other again, I like Andy Reid. Love what he's done with the Chiefs. He gets too pass happy. And. He, Unfortunately, <laughs> on this side of the table, we like the running game and defense and, and, and feel like and feel like those things yeah. actually win you games in the postseason. Andy Reid goes too far with it. That's been my knock. Winlock, I got a newsflash for you. Without Kareem Hunt, that pass happy is going to be to the next level this year yeah, because you, he you, has Patrick Mahomes. You, you might not. It's not so far out of the realm to believe that Patrick Mahomes in some game. And some game this year is going to throw the ball 60 times. Now, people think that I'm, I'm pass happy. I mean, run happy. It's not about being run happy. With me, in order for offenses, in my opinion, to be successful, they need to have some kind of balance to them. And when you get out of balance, you know as a defensive, as a defensive end, if I know that they ain't running the ball, right, I got my ears pent back. Yep. You know, and I'm coming. Mm. You can't put quarterbacks in that position, in my, in my opinion, especially in the playoffs. Especially in the playoffs. And, and again... I got a lot of respect for Andy Reid. I watched what he did in Philadelphia for 14 years. He took a team that was in the doldrums and gave the city hope. So I understand it. I get it. But, but like Jason said, his problem is he'll get in big games, and instead of running the ball, instead of using the screen game, instead of using the full repertoire of offense that he has, he falls in love with, with the passing game. He makes himself predictable instead of forcing the defense to make him predictable, and it winds up biting him in the behind every single time. Well, well, what, yeah, 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 he it. does the same thing that he's been doing to get the success. So this is where I, I struggle. When you look at the list, Bill Belichick, what has he always had the luxury of having? A great quarterback. On no, this, on, no, no. Listen, listen. On this list, no. everybody has Tom either a, early was not great. A, I'll give you that. Or a great defense. That was my. That was going to be my point. On this list, when we look at these coaches, either you have a shutdown lights out defense, or you have the biggest game changer or, let me at give you quarterback. Another. Or you're self aware enough to know. I coached in Philadelphia and I coached in Kansas City outdoor stadiums where the weather turns different in November, December, and January, and it's a different game. We always talk about identity. He is who he is. Build an identity for the stadium you play in. Greg, if you want to be Sean Payton, move to New Orleans. Greg, let me, let me ask you this question, okay? If you've done a certain thing a, a certain way for a long time and it doesn't work, you know, Hold on. Wait, 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 wait a minute. This has worked. Yeah, oh, no, thank no. you. It has worked. It hasn't got him over the hump. What hump? Okay. It's only one hump. Like the championship. Uh, that's well, the but that's, we wait a minute. So if you didn't win a championship, greatness is out the window? No. Are, are we doing that for players and coaches? Listen, Where are we going with this? Dan Reeves, is he great? No. Chuck Knox, Jeff no. Fisher, 
Marty Shot, how you put you throw great on them? No, but Kubiak that's the box he's in. Ain't great either. He got I look. didn't call him great. No, okay, but hold on, we going this championship or bust? No, no. My, my my thing is the NFL is and always has been an adjustment league. Okay, and if you've done something a certain way and you refuse to adjust and you keep getting the same result, what's that called? Insanity. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Jennings and Seth Joyner are back with us. Let's move to Green Bay, where the Packers are searching for a new coach in the wake of the firing of Mike McCarthy after 13 years at the helm. The speculation about who they will hire is running wild, and one name being floated is none other than Packers legend Brett Favre, but the gunslinger addressed the idea this week in an interview with TMZ. Would a head coach job of the Packers be something that would interest you? Oh, it's definitely interesting, but believe me, I, that, that's not going to happen. Uh, I mean, how could you not be intrigued by the, by that? Now, you, you know, even even if just – and this, this would never happen. They would never offer. But even if they would, I, I – you know, that's uh, – I'm not ready for that, and, and neither are they. I, 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 listen, y'all gonna think I'm joking, and I'm Greg. You'll probably laugh me off the stage. I think he would be a great NFL head coach. Great is the a word. Great NFL head coach. I, I think I, I go back. I've always said this, Greg. The, the his most famous game is the game he played on Monday night. I think after his p dad passed okay. away, mm -hmm. and I think everybody read the game wrong. Oh, it's Greg Farm's greatest performance, and it wasn't. It was the greatest performance by his teammates that all stood up for him, because guys love Brett Favre. It don't matter where, from the city, from the sticks, from wherever. Brett Favre has a personality that connects with NFL players, and I think he has a genuine passion for the X's and O's of football. And so I think in the right situation, maybe you get him somewhere for a couple years as an offensive coordinator <coughs> with an older, wiser head coach, and then could he be a head coach in the NFL? Absolutely. I, I think he would be an amazing NFL head coach. I don't root against anybody in this world, but he would be one of the worst coaches we've ever seen in our game. And it's just been – he's given us evidence. He basically said that without rooting against himself, saying, look, they ain't going to give me the job. And let's be real, I ain't even ready for the job. So here's the real of it. Mike Singletary was an amazing player. <laughs> How that turned out. Uh, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, great connections with their teammates. Amazing Larry Bird was players. a good coach. Uh, all right. Oh, oh. Bad team didn't find Andy, Andy Reid get a bad rap? I'm saying he's a good coach. <laughs> okay, good Larry coach. Bird, okay, this great. <laughs> Let to the final. Larry Bird's great now as a coach. <laughs> I said good. Did anybody else hear me say good coach? I'm with Go you. With like, yeah. here's, here's exhibit A. When Brett Favre was there and they drafted one Aaron Rodgers, what was, what was the, the sentiment from Brett Favre about teaching Aaron Rodgers anything? That, I ain't here to teach this dude. Okay, okay. So you don't have the coaching spirit. You don't have the coaching pure spirit. You ain't Sean McVay trying to be an intern, work your way up the ranks and finally become, boom, head coach in the NFL. You're Brett Favre, superstar status, superstar player who says, Put me in that position, and we'll see how it plays out. That doesn't work. I need a coach who knows the highs and lows of the locker room, the different personalities of the locker room, not just a guy who speaks one language, language, which is superstar. I don't think he would do it because he's never shown that he went outside of his box to just make sure he helped others in terms of teaching relationships. Greg, like, but Greg played with him. Greg, like Teddy, Teddy, Bru Teddy Brewski right now. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Teddy straight. I, I, yeah, Teddy yeah, straight. yeah, yeah, because, I, I mean, you had me initially, kind of, sort of. Yeah. Number one, I don't think Brett Favre would be a terrible head coach. So we're, we're split on this side. The reason why I don't think it would work in Green Bay is because, like he said, he's just not ready. And the expectations would be so high when you look at Bart Starr and what he was able to do or what he was not able to do, the expectations to take on that type of a franchise and to win right away with a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers, no. But the details of coaching and preparation, Brett, Fa Brett Favre is second to none with his preparation and how he prepared. The difference with Brett Favre and why I think he would struggle initially is because he would long for that quarterback specifically or players alike to play the way the game the way he played it. Meaning, I'm very detailed, I will prepare, I will work my butt off, but then while I'm on that football field, on that turf, my instincts have to kick in and I have to become even greater than what I've prepared for and what my coaches have installed in me. And I just don't, I don't think players will be able to stand up and, and live up to what his expectations are for them. You know, I played with Brett, too. Phenomenal, phenomenal teammate, phenomenal guy. 
Um, I agree with him that he's not ready for this job. I don't think he'd be a terrible quarterback, a, a terrible head coach, but I think in some ways it would work and a lot of ways it wouldn't work. I mean, I'm, I, I read his, his, his quote here where he says, you know, about when he was coaching in high school, how he doesn't like to beat up the players and he doesn't like to, you know, harass the players and whatnot. Um, that could be a positive thing. Because, and I think he feels that way because you got to go all the way back to Atlanta when Jerry Glanville um, drafted him and how Jerry treated him. So I think from a head coaching standpoint of how to deal with players, how to deal with his quarterback, I think he'd be really good at that. But I don't think that Brett Favre is ready to be a head coach in the NFL. Come on, man. I mean, listen. Yeah, let's, let's, yeah let's, there we let's, go. Now we're talking. Let's, 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 let's start from the standpoint. No more golf tournament let's, homeboy. Let's, let's, start, let's start from the standpoint that – you know, there are guys that have been coaching 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years in the NFL waiting for an opportunity to become a head coach. And Brett Favre, Hall of Fame quarterback, great at what he did, you know, he's just going to walk into Green Bay and be of great benefit to this football team as a head coach without never having coached in the it NFL. It can happen. It'll be a nightmare. I have questions. No, no, it can happen. I think I think it'll be a have, nightmare out questions. the gate. I have questions because we all know being a great player, being a great teammate, is it's not hard. the same as being a great coach. Absolutely, that's a huge leap. Absolutely. One, do you? He questioned his own effort even before he became a high school coach. High school coach, when we know that's like a three three hour one period job. This is a 14, 16, 18 hour job, and you already have a very comfortable silk robe lifestyle. Are you ready and dedicated to that is a question. And also, communication. Uh, you talk about the expectations and pressure he's going to put on his players because he knows how great they can be. Are you willing to learn 53 different languages to make sure that every single player exactly hears what your message is? That's my question Him about Brett Favre from afar. To answer your question, to the, to the first part, he's admitted I'm not ready, and yes, I want to. I'm not. My effort wouldn't be there. Right. To the second part, he doesn't need to learn 53 different languages because his language is what you're going to buy into, and that's the one thing that I I don't think you're really understanding. When he was playing and Aaron Rodgers came into the fold, he was at his prime and his peak. Why am I going to look back and say, "Oh yeah, come take my spot"? No, you wouldn't do that. Oh, so, it was done for me. No, and, and it was Bruce, done for you. Oh, and that's but why you I, didn't choose to do that. Hold on, but uh, I didn't. I, I did it because it wasn't even a conversation because it was done for me. So to me, it wasn't even something I thought about. Bruce Smith was the man. And I got drafted to Buffalo. Bruce was like, come on. I teach you everything. Because you know what? When you're really great and securing that, you don't mind building someone up. Because you're still thinking, I'm the man. You're not coming to take See, my you job. Know, we, we touched on this a little bit yesterday. And I'm glad you brought it up. Because I got real problems with anyone who plays in this league and their heir apparent is behind them, and they don't want to pay it forward. Yeah. I got problems with that, Me man. Me too. I got big, big, big problems with listen, it. Listen, though. Because that's the, way, that's the way it's always been. That's the way it should be. If you think, listen, you draft him, you bring him in, bring him to me. I'll train him. He still ain't good enough to take my yeah, job. That's, that's, that's how I think. Most but, mentality. But, but listen, I, here's what I don't think y'all giving Brett credit for, is I do think he has self-awareness. Love Greg's point about... They're going to love his language because mm -hmm. that's what a head coach does. And I think he speaks a language in a way that attracts everybody or a large segment of the room. But the other thing I just think y'all are miscalculating is you can play the player's role and then transition into another job and be smart enough to say, you know, the things I did as a player won't work here as a head coach. Agreed. And that's because I see it all the time. The things I used to do as a newspaper writer. Mm. I don't do here on TV. We're under a different standard. This is a totally different discipline, so I'm a bit different. I can never forget the first time I started appearing on ESPN, people that listened to my radio show in Kansas City were like, man, you ain't nothing like you were uh, on our radio show. How come you're not this way on the sports reporters? Right. And I said, because Dick Schaap and Mike Lupica and Barbara, that's not who they signed me up to be, mm. the guy that hosts this radio show. I'm playing a whole different role. I think Brett Favre, everything that I feel like I understand by, and in terms of the commitment and the effort, I don't think he would take the job unless he knew, because mm -hmm. he knows what it takes. I don't think he'd take the job unless he felt like he could give that kind of effort. One question. Because he doesn't want to embrace it. Was that show on ESPN 18 hours a day? No. Well, damn it. You know what? I don't want to hear it, because this, <laughs> this job, this show he going to do in NFL is 18 hours a day. Let's move to Pittsburgh, where the Steelers face off with the Patriots Sunday. 
but are still dealing with the drama about Mike Tomlin's decision and Big Ben's decision for Big Ben to sit out a lot of the second half of their loss to the Raiders. Tomlin claims the team hasn't had any extra drama this year, despite the fact that people were actually calling for his job this week. Yesterday, Bill Belichick was asked if he expects the drama to affect the Steelers this Sunday. Yeah, I think if you guys are around competitive guys, you wouldn't see that. So I, I don't really see that. I don't, I don't have to give that any credibility at all. Um, you know, competitive people compete. That's what they do. And certainly that's what the Steelers are. So I'm sure we'll get their best. I think they'll get our best. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I agree with Belichick on the end of this. They are going to get the Steelers' best. Mm -hmm. The beginning of it, I disagree with. Part of the reason they're going to get the Steelers' best is because of the drama and the controversy. The Steelers are embarrassed right now. They, they damn near lost the AFC North because of their own stupidity. They're going to come out and play their best game of the season against the New England Patriots. I think Big Ben's going to be motivated. I think the Steelers' defense is going to be motivated. Obviously, Antonio Brown and Juju Smith-Schuster, mm. they're going to – I think they're going to put it on the Patriots this week. Oh, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I would say that the, the Pittsburgh Steelers are embarrassed and the Patriots are disgusted. Thank you. The way that they lost that game, and I lost one of those games in the playoffs and Music City Miracle. So, uh, there was no coming back to really get that salty taste out your mouth, but they have an opportunity to. So, you're talking about two fully motivated teams that are going to clash. I don't want to conflate the outcome of this game – and say that's validation of the Pittsburgh Steelers finally realizing we are drama kings or queens, whatever you want to call this team. I don't want to do that because they may lose this game and still be tired of all the drama. They may lose this game and still say, hey, we've righted our ship in terms of our focus is laser going forward and they still can win this division. So I'm not going to look at this outcome and say Pittsburgh Steelers, oh, the drama caught up to you or you're still not over the drama. I I'm looking at this team like you're playing the Patriots. In December, when they play some winning football, and that may be a tough task, but I don't think – I think that it's exaggerated, all the drama around Pittsburgh. You know, I, I, got, I just got this thing with drama and um, – and what's the, the word that I'm looking at? Everybody talks about these distractions. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, that's nothing more than a scapegoat for when you don't play well and you don't achieve your goals. Um, the drama is real, you know, before the game and after the game. You got – three hours, three and a half hours to play a game and the first time you get hit in the mouth, all of that chatter that happened during the week ceases, mm. okay? The truth of the matter is the Patriots got their number and they're going to continue to have their number because right now as a, as a team, there's a lot of dysfunction and what that, what all those distractions really do during the week is it, it, it prevents you from focusing in on preparation. Yeah. And if you're not prepared against a Bill Belichick team that's coming off of that type of loss, mm. Okay, they coming in there to do work. Yeah. They coming in there to do work, and and I just don't I, don't. I don't. I don't see the Steelers winning this game. Love the Steelers this week. I don't see the Steelers winning either. And when it, I think what frustrates them more than anything is they know, and as well as us, everyone watching and on paper, they have the most talent, the better talent, but they always seem to get out coached and out executed. Mm. And that's what this game typically comes down to. When you look at what happened and transpired last year, you got one player, regardless of how we feel about it or what side we're on, reaching out. One thing Belichick coaches against is don't extend that ball, just run through the line. And when you think about little things like that, they come to bite you in games like this. And the Pittsburgh Steelers, they'll give them their best shot because they circle this game. This is really their Super Bowl every single year. We, this is who we're focused on to beat, and we, which is why things like last week happens, because you're looking forward to this team, and this mm. team's still going to beat you. And, and look, it's not a slight to hear that the Steelers get out coached by Bill no. Belichick. No. Most like, teams he's the do. most winningest <laughs> coach we have, right? But second – is Mike Tomlin in terms of active wins. So this is a game that's going to come down to those details. And you always talk about Ben Roethlisberger and his leadership. Um, I don't know if Ben Roethlisberger gets an A-plus in attention to detail and translating that message to his team. I think a lot of times the gift and the curse of talent is – those details are for those who are less talented. For us, we just go out there and do our thing. And you play Belichick, he has just enough sneaky talent on that roster <laughs> to go out there with fine details and beat you every time. On the road, 
and Big Ben backed into a corner. I see, I think Big Ben has chirped enough and done enough now that people, I think, just because we've looked at Big Ben off the field and scrutinized him. I don't think people have ever truly scrutinized him on the field. And I think that process is starting to happen. And the questions about his leadership, I love Big Ben backed into a corner, backed into the same corner with Mike Tomlin. Pittsburgh's a better team than the Patriots. The Patriots, generally speaking to me, are better coached and more efficient, and they have a quarterback that's a true leader. I think for the first time in a long time, the Steelers are going to meet the, the Patriots' level of execution and efficiency. Mm. They're going to have everything buttoned up. St and the game will be close. The Steelers will win this game. They have no other choice. If they lose it, there, there will be a lot of conversation about the chaos, and particularly if Baltimore beats Tampa Bay, right. and all of a sudden they're in a dogfight just to win their division. I don't think they let it happen. I would agree with all that if the Patriots hadn't lost last week. Yeah, the way that they <laughs> lost. The last play. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Seth. Time we put on our thinking caps. All right, we're joined by Fox NBA analyst Iceberg Jim Jackson <laughs> and about that action, Steven yeah, Jackson. I like Always. That. I like that. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Like As you Bars. all know, I'm a journalist, and we've got our resident Ivy Leaguer here, Marcellus Wiley, <laughs> Columbia's finest. So uh, we're going to take a deeper look at some big, is big issues in sports. Got a special cap for our man, Marcellus Darnell. Uh, uh -oh. Bring it in. Dun, dun, dun. Oh. oh, thank you very much. You wore those jeans uh, uh, two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> Change it up, bro. Don't <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll put him out like on national. Oh, like, oh, like, oh, 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 Let's move to Chicago, <laughs> where the Bulls have been embarrassing themselves on the court this year and are now embarrassing themselves off the court as well after a franchise record 56-point loss over the weekend. Interim head coach Jim Bolin demanded a two-hour practice out of his players who were so upset that they threatened to boycott, and some of them actually complained to the Players Association. Boland, for his part, says the organization stands behind his decision to demand more out of his players. Gentlemen, we scratched the surface on this topic a little bit yesterday, and that's why we wanted to circle back to it today. I contend we're giving players too much control over these leagues, and when they have control, they're going to do things to make it easier for them as players. <laughs> and the, what's going on with the Chicago Bulls is a prime example. You have entitled players, irate, that their coach is actually being demanding of them. Uh, I just think NBA players are a bit too entitled. I don't think so. Um, we may be seeing, to your point, an overcorrection, which we see in a lot of facets of life and society, when things were wrong to begin with, and then you see the excess to change that, and then we're going to find some healthy middle ground. Um, I don't think these players are entitled. I think players of yesteryear who were superstars didn't have proper rights, didn't have proper access, didn't have the movability that these players do now. When you're a superstar, you expect superstar treatment. That doesn't mean easier. It means... <laughs> it don't. No, it, it means <laughs> respecting who I am and that you can't have the control because I'm the one that's fully out there executing what the vision of this franchise is. Case in point, you don't have to go through hell to get to heaven. There are a lot of coaches out there that think I that... I hope you do, because that's the only way I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't lying. There are a lot of coaches that think that killing players is a necessary evil to build them up, to strengthen them, to get them mentally tough. That's not true. There are too many coaches in my sport. I can only stay in my world. I've heard of Phil Jackson practices. I've heard of all those type of practices. I know a Byron Scott practice is different than a Phil Jackson practice. But in my world, there are a lot of championship coaches who just were like, dude, you only have to practice and play to the ability that we're building you up, not breaking you down. Uh, Marv Levy was a coach that had an easy mindset. He took that from Bill Walsh, who won championships. You take that to a Pete Carroll of today, who won championships. You take that to a lot of coaches who are like, we're not destroying our players. But then there's a contrast. There's a Bill Parcells and others who are like, break you down to build you up. I think these players are entitled to the treatment that they're getting, and it's not an easier path. It's just a smarter, wiser path. You can't complain when you Omeka Okafor at 95, you zero and 95. You can't complain. Mm. They have no room to complain. This is just a, a situation where these guys are just spoiled. It's, I don't, I, I, I don't, 
when, when you suck like they do, when you have guys on your team that half of guys don't even want to show up for practice, half of them don't even show up for games, and your record's like it is, you have no room to complain. Come out, change the organization, mm -hmm. then you have some room to complain. But I'm, I'm with the coach, I'm with the organization. Be as hard as you can because you're paying these guys millions of dollars, and they're not doing their job. You have no room to complain. Do better. Well, you, you, you don't, and we've always been entitled as athletes. Is that what degree does it go to? Right now, guys do have more of a voice, but I think it's a communicational, a communication mm -hmm. issue. I think it was Joe Maddox with uh, the Cubs talked about him digging in more into social media to understand the millennials and how to communicate with them. Jim Boylan came in, obviously, with directive from management top. that th things needed to change. But how you communicate that is the issue. These young guys right now, it's tough to communicate because when you give them criticism, they look at it like, oh, you're trying to dog me out. Right. No, bro, I'm just trying to give you some criticism. Right. But because they haven't been taught that way, that when a negative situation comes up, they look at, they look at it differently. So, yes, they are spoiled. Yes, it is different. Like I said yesterday, when I played for Pat Riley, we had two and a half hour mm -hmm. practice all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, it what? And that, I wish you would complain. I wish you would complain about mm -hmm. it. Okay, Larry Brown's practices was more detailed, more intricate, and more basic right. than a, maybe a Phil Jackson, than a Mike D'Antoni. It just depends on the system. So, but then again, with the Bulls, y'all responsible for this monster. Hmm. Y'all kept a coach that wasn't getting to these guys for years. Y'all just fired a coach that should have been fired a long time ago. Fred so, Hoybar. Right. So y'all yeah. so y'all built this monster. Now y'all got to deal with it. But hold on. I, I, I want to push back on this. If you're not going hard, you're not going at all. Because there's many trails up to the top of this mountain. Look, Steve Kerr is right now having guys doing underwater aerobics and yoga and not these type of practices. And they are dynastic. And in your era, there were coaches mm -hmm. who were like, look, man, Popovich is amazing. And he comes, Jim Boylan comes from his tree. Mm -hmm. Respect. But Popovich also, in his dynasty, never won back-to-backs. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means, but... He never had the most talented team by far the way Golden State does. Oh, Kobe mm -hmm. Bryant and Tim Duncan is like the best of their era, but he didn't have the most talent. But, I but, but, but they did, though. <laughs> I'm telling you something. They had it, talent. It, it, it was teams like this, like San Antonio from 1 through 12 probably wasn't the most talented team. Right. 1 through 5, maybe. Mm -hmm. They were up there, but completely they weren't. But here's the difference. Teams are different, and coaches are different in, in their dynamics and how they coach and how they train, okay? Right. What Steve Kerr does with a more veteran type of team and leaders with Golden State is different than a young team in Chicago. They're proven winners. Who, who's the leader on Chicago? Who has the voice to say, you know what, this practice is messed up, old school. Coach, let me holler at you in the locker room real quick. But it wasn't so, like that day uh, one with oh, Steve no, Kerr. No, this is what I'm saying. Day I'm talking one, about, it was I'm, easy with them. But I'm saying course. the difference between this if I had a problem with Jeff Van Gundy, me and Jeff can sit in the room and I say, the team is thinking this. Let's figure out a solution to this. Mm -hmm. Right now, the young guys don't really have that. Who on that Chicago team right. has that leadership capability to galvanize the team, one thing, right. but then to take the language to communicate it with Jim Boyle? Zach Levine, Levine said that same thing. He said, we don't have a Kevin Garnett. Right, right. So right. We get why you don't feel we And then the, the thing with Golden State, you got to remember, man, Mark Jackson laid a hell of a foundation. Yes, true. And then Steve Kerr just transitioned mm -hmm. it. At, but again, Marcellus, do you not believe in the cliche, iron sharpens iron? I do. I do. A at the same time, I'm looking at uh, all players talk. All players know, look, when I'm playing and I'm active and I'm like, yo, man, we over here, we're 4 and 12. And I got. Marty Schottenheimer, we dying in practice mm -hmm. to four wins. <laughs> then I talked to my boy. He got Mike Shanahan. They over there chilling, and they winning and they Super Bowls. And they got John And they got John Elway. And the point of that is... Stan Humphreys, I don't know. It was Steve. But the point of that is... Ain't hey, nothing worse than when you hear somebody doing it in an efficient way. I don't like saying easy, because, look, right. I don't give a damn what practice you're in. You're going to get tired. You're going to be sore. You went through something. Uh, an efficient way, and then you find out that they're winning, and then you over there going through hell and losing. That's what I think is going on Did Marty right Schottenheimer not go 14-2 over there? No, he did. I mean, I'm, not when I was on the team. <laughs> <laughs> it was on me, did. Yeah, but that no I, You rejected the iron. Marty got some guys that took the iron, mm -hmm. and they be 14 and Don't 2. Don't make me talk bad about Marty's right now. <laughs> That's what you're trying to do, and it no, ain't going to work. Not. I'm a vet to this. No, Marty Schottenheimer also didn't win a championship. Got it. See, he made me do it. And, 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 <laughs> <laughs> he got you. <laughs> but, you know, but then I'm watching Pete Carroll go out there. Uh, we can see so many guys, Mike Shanahan, uh, uh, Mike Tomlin, like you can win a championship in many a ways, not just this old iron shot from Zion way. If the Bulls were at the top of the East right now, 
Thank and they complain about practice, it would be no problem. Right. They're terrible. You can't complain when you lose. And that's point. That's what it is. You can't complain when you lose. Let me tell you how, mm. to me, how Hard. entitled the league has gotten in. And in this situation, I kind of understand it. But there was a story this week. Mike D'Antoni, according to a scout that scouted him, didn't call a play the entire game. And I know why you got James Harden, you got Chris Paul, you got veteran guys. Mm -hmm. But also it's because Mike D'Antoni, he, he don't want to get crossways with these guys. He's scared. And so he's just, Harden, Chris Paul, y'all handle it. He's scared. And Houston is a dumpster fire this year. Yeah. They are, uh, it, you just can't blame it all on Trevor Ariza mm -hmm. being gone. Right. They're a dumpster Armello. fire this year. Or, or Melo. Yeah, I was going to say that. And I've been critical of Melo. But, but when the coach is scared because the players have so much power. Mm -hmm. You know, but Chris Paul, other than LeBron, maybe the most powerful guy in the NBA, Scared coaching. Can man. we can we take these suits off and go into that locker room? We're Chicago. We sorry. Mm -hmm. We're not good in any right. major statistical category except free throw shooting. Mm -hmm. And that's because coach probably making us shoot <laughs> a thousand of them suckers every day. Okay. I'm looking at you and I'm like, yeah, you came from Papa Bitch, but who are you, bro? What if he turns out to be a bad coach? And you over here trying to take years and tread off my tires to what by making him practice? To what event? By making him practice, by we making all, him do push-ups. Hold on. I'm not saying each and every element. You I'm sound like me, Marcellus, talking to my personal trainer. <laughs> How dare <laughs> you <laughs> ask me to work on <laughs> <But> Marcellus, <laughs> but you understand, Jim Boylan goes, you, you know the assistant coaches, those are ones you can go to all the time mm -hmm. and talk to. It's hard to talk to a head coach sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Jim Boylan was in the co-pilot seat. Yeah. He immediately jumped into the first position mm -hmm. and changed things like this. And where, I hate that. Where the players were like, Man, we were just talk talking to you about this, and now you went this way. Mm -hmm. But again, this is something he felt he had to do. But I think both sides, the communication dropped, okay? Mm -hmm. You need to pull a player to the side and say, listen, this is what we're going to do as a team. I need you to talk to them to make sure we're on the same page. I'm going to do it no matter what, yeah. but this is how you – but both sides failed in the communication, I think, area, and that's why you have this situation. Yeah. Sometimes they kids, man, you tell your kids, talk to the hand. I'm daddy up right. here. Well, that's true. Up yeah, here. daddy, but what the push-ups going to do for me? <laughs> Make it three-pointers, I daddy. wish my father made me do more push-ups. <laughs> Time for my favorite segment. Oh, we got man. a special <laughs> anti-social segment. The Jackson brothers are here. Iceberg yes. and about that action, Jackson. Oh, he about to get you. I like that. I like that. Look, he, he already got it facing my way. Darnell Smith, our social media manager's here. Yeah, what Darnell, up? Darnell, what's, what's popping on those Twitter streets? Yeah, man, we're going to get started up in Charlotte, mm. where Michael Jordan went full disappointed dad mode on Malik Monk. <laughs> <laughs> MJ smacked Monk upside the head if he put up a silly technical foul for running on the court too soon mm. to celebrate J Jeremy Lamb's game winner. MJ said today there was a big brother, little brother love dynamic. But do y'all have an issue with this? I, I, I don't. I know what it feels like. I yeah. got a couple texts when I was in Charlotte, right. so I know what that feels like. But mm. if you're going to get a tap in the back of the head from a big brother, that'd it, be, that'd be MJ, right, exactly. <laughs> that was, that'd be that was MJ. more like your father. Boy, didn't I tell you not to do yes. that? Didn't I, didn't I tell Boy, you not to do that? Yeah. I was probably <laughs> licking his fingers. <laughs> didn't do it. You know how those That's a is. different dynamic from your owner. Like, think about it. I know. I've never played with an owner. Actually, I think it's cool. I, I never played it. with an owner. I was comfortable enough to even take that tap. Yep. But that's you see, Malik Monk didn't do anything. He was like, man, that's Mike. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do like believe this, though. Mike's the only person that could do this. And get away with it. No in question. Sports. In sports. In sports. Where, where it wouldn't be a controversy. Right. And where... Because the other thing you got to think about Mike, and Steve, you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I would probably tend to think Mike probably still plays a little pickup basketball with the guys on the team. Oh, yeah, he definitely does. And so yeah, it's yeah, a whole know, different yeah, dynamic yeah, yeah, yeah. with Mike and his players. You seen the videos with him dunking still? The yes. videos with them baggy jeans? He needs to stop with the <laughs> Man, we got the baggiest jeans in the game. With the 23 on the hey, back. Hold on, hold on. Did he take the hoop out, though? No, did he take the hoop out, though? But he took the chain in oh, there. Okay. So he, he, he destroyed us in practice when I was there in Charlotte one year. With so the he, jeans? He still, no, he didn't have the jeans on. He didn't have baggy on. shorts on. But, but just think about the jeans what, if, what if Mark Cuban had oh, done this no, to no, man, It would be a whole problem. different conversation. Yeah. Well, yeah, it'd be a whole... We, it, we'll go into a whole racial epitaph, too, if uh, that was to happen. Uh, you know what I mean? I, Seriously. So the only black owner in sports, basically... Well, I mean, Michael players, Jordan... Where are we going? I, I, I don't think you, you relate the same concept to a black owner doing it to a black player. I just don't think... Uh, you know. I, 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 would, I would even Michael Jordan with any other owner because he sat on them sidelines. He's like a player sitting there. He's not just... But Steve DJ. Kerr couldn't do it. You see it. what I'm saying? Uh, I'm not, I, 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 I don't, don't know if Steve Kerr could do it. I wouldn't say that. Mm. I wouldn't say that because I had a relationship with Steve Kerr 
in San Antonio. Uh -huh. And we had that type of relationship. Like, if right. he would have done it, it would have been cool because he was like a mentor to me. So he's probably okay. one of those guys because he's been in those wars. So you can kind of understand him. Mm. Darnell, can me and Marcellus slap you on the back of your head? <laughs> <laughs> I, hey, how about gonna DDT y'all? Right. <laughs> First of all, second of all, hey, y'all better pay me. Them young muscles. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna be Darnell clear. over there. Swole, I'm, yeah, swole. Swole. I'm with Darnell. I'm with Darnell. <laughs> he, <swole. laughs> he ain't even had lunch yet. He's just. Swole. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Darnell can smack me and you in the back yeah, of the head. Yeah, <laughs> we can't do nothing about it. <laughs> yes, he could. All right, silly, Darnell, what's next? Yeah, moving on to another. Another former NBA player, Derek Fisher, who recently teamed up with a financial group that allows NBA players to take out big loans using their property, contracts, and pensions as collateral. Baron Day was ripped, D. Fish, tweeting, quote, Derek Fisher sold us out in the CBA, and now he's selling us out again. Athletes going broke, let's make money off of that. Davis wasn't the only person to weigh in. Nets forward Jared Dudley also warned players to stay away from this. Guys, why does everyone seem to hate Derek Fisher? Let me be first. Let me be first. <laughs> I, I'm ready. Because I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I, 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 start, I, I make it simple. I started this because right. I was the one who wrote the story <laughs> during the CBA when he did pull some shenanigans and I felt like didn't have the best interest of the players. And so I, I'm actually glad to see this out. It's not because I have a bunch of animosity towards Derek Fisher, but uh, I, I, I agree with Baron Davis here. This whole operation of... Kind of halfway loan sharking, young athletes or whatever. Come on, man. I mean, mm. come on. I mean, isn't it enough? I mean, mm. you're mm. skipping practices to go, <laughs> go meet with somebody, somebody else's <laughs> ex-wife and mm. all this other stuff, man. Yeah, told the organization you needed to go for your daughter. For your daughter. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, really yeah. yeah, All right, here we go. <laughs> this is what I heard. D uh, Fist, the homie, BD, my homie, too. Perception is not always reality with D Fist. That's obviously been an issue, and we've seen some of the instances. I don't like this tweet from BD, though, because I don't think that they're looking at it from the same vantage point. It seems to me that Derek Fisher's like, in case of emergency, here's something for you that will... got a payday loan for you. Hold on. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> look, and our rate's going to be dumb high. You know what? 25%. I'm about through the roof. Y'all yeah. taking it like... Higher he, than your vertical. <laughs> Y'all taking it like he rooting for you to get into this position. He's saying, I could take better care of you from that position. And there are players in dire yeah, true, circumstances. True. Somebody's going to say, hey, I can help you out it's that It's still hole. a payday loan, Marcella. <laughs> With your track record, you're not the one to, to, to <laughs> yeah, That's promote. a greater that, point. That's that, a okay, greater first of all, that's what you're a walking shenanigan. That's what you are, <laughs> a walking shenanigan. Right. Oh, I live off morals, first of all. Yeah. We played in this game. We mm -hmm. have a, a code that we stick right. with, OK? Even if, I, even if I don't consider you my brother, if I play with you in any amount of time, all the women in this world that we can get, it's no way you go back and date your teammate's wife or ex-wife. Mm. So, therefore, anything he does, as far as our brotherhood, we're not with it at all. And yeah. you take it a step further. At all. We're not yeah. with it. Yeah. You're talking about perception. It's not oh. But the perception is that when he and Matt Barnes were together, it was some stuff going on. Because all of a sudden, it just don't happen. Right. It had to be something going on. So, guys in the league see that. So, they're like, okay, hold up. So, we can trust you with this in the, during the union stuff with the CBA. Strike one. Strike one. Hey. We see what happened with Matt Barnes, like strike two. That's now out. you coming at oh, us. Oh, no, don't forget what happened with the Knicks. Oh, with the Knicks. Three. Oh, with the Knicks, too. Strike okay. three. Strike three. So now you coming in and saying, OK, well, <sighs> we're going to use your contracts as future collateral against the loan, but you involved in it. Who are the... No, you going to do it? And, and, okay. and again, oh, cool. it's who it's coming cool. from. Okay. Whether it's right or wrong, it's who it's coming from. I need some of this to rub off on me, because one of my teammates married my ex, and I ain't tripping on it. But what you, should hey, I do? It, it, it ain't the fact that we could be... Your ex-wife? Hey, you, you know why you ain't tripping? One of your teammates married oh, your ex-wife? Ex oh, no, oh, come on. Right, 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 hey, right. hey, but look. Hey, it was my oh, ex. But look, look, look. your ex what? Girlfriend? Fiance oh. in the middle. But look, you ain't... Put it in your face! You know why you ain't tripping? You know why you ain't tripping, big fella? Because you not the you not the buster. He the buster. He the buster. You yeah, the buster. buster. You, 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 probably, you, you probably was like, I'm glad you took her off yeah, my hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to be serious. I want to I want to be okay. serious here for a minute because oh, I want to be fair to Derek Fisher and I'm being serious in all seriousness. Because during the CBA thing, I kept reaching out to him and because I used to know Derek mm -hmm. Fisher. And, and before I reported this stuff about the CBA. And I kept reaching out to him, and I think his sister or somebody, he, his assistant would call me. D Fish would never reach back out to me. I don't want to be unfair here in this situation as re relates to Baron Davis. If Derek Fisher sees this, 
We would love to have you on this show. Oh, yeah. We'd love to discuss this and give you a fair opportunity mm -hmm to t present your side and what it is you're trying to do with this business. There would be no ridicule or mocking. It would be a very serious conversation. You're worthy of that and deserve that. You did some great things as a player. Uh, but, you know, from my vantage point and it seemed like from other vantage point, you've also done some shady stuff. Mm. There it is. And Inception. I won't yeah. be here. Hold up, put it down. <laughs> put it, mark it down. Don't call, 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 call me that day, I right? I won't be here. Come on. All right, thank you, Jim. Thank you, right. Steven. Uncle Jimmy's here to help us talk about our approval ratings for Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> is it Uncle... <laughs> Uncle Julius Caesar Salad, is that who, Caesar Salad. <laughs> is that who you are? Who are you? Yeah. Ex Friends, fellows, and countrymen, come with me as we blaze into the future. <laughs> what? So lend me your ear. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, lend, me your ear. lend me your I'm ear. I'm sorry, I messed that all up. Pro some X Clan or something. Man. <laughs> Exist in a state of vanglory. <laughs> there you go. We are As protected. protected. <laughs> there you go. Whoa, Damn, y'all went really old school. All right, man. Let's Whoa. take a look at a highlight from our discussion <laughs> earlier about Patrick Mahomes. Ah, uh, but here's the truth from the smartest man in football, Fox Sports 1's very own Jason Whitlock. The Chargers have no shot tonight, none. Mm. This game is far better on paper than in reality. Mm. You messing with my money right now. <laughs> <laughs> my Chargers. Damn right. Uh, we're doing some Jedi mind tricks out there for the Chargers. We may lose this one. We're going to gain great confidence and great intel against you and beat you when it counts postseason. Yes. All right, They're Uncle matter. Julius Caesar salad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what's your take on our conversation about I the I could Chief start Charles? this thing off yeah. by, how dareth you <laughs> <laughs> compare thyself to the smartest man <laughs> in football? Mm. When you're sitting right up there next to a man with the accomplishments of Mark Ellis Wiley. <laughs> Mark, Mark Ellis. Mark Anthony, I guess. Mark He's Julius Anthony. Caesar. Mark Ellis. Uh, there you go. <laughs> in tune. Uh, it's just straight blasphemy. <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's beyond blasphemy, Jason. <laughs> I, I'm trying to figure out, Mark, you do realize, son, that I've seen your SAT scores. Uh-oh. <laughs> Keep yeah. talking. Yeah. You do realize I've seen your SAT yeah, scores, Jason. Too, yeah. Three digits you, or two? Hey, man. <laughs> you know you weighed more than your math score, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> at birth. At birth. <laughs> Bro, you going, just, hey, Uncle, you're going too far, Uncle Jimmy. That's, that's an exaggeration. That's an exaggeration. No okay. math. He didn't say English. He said math. He might be wait, right. Wait, wait, wait. That's going too far? Okay. Yeah. Your, 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 first, your first semester at Ball State, mm. did you have a 1.0 average? <laughs> hey, man. Uh, uh, <laughs> right, that's it. Wait, Let wait. me clear did my throat. Did the coach want to send you home <laughs> right after that? 1.0? Uh, don't answer it, Jason. <laughs> Mac 1.0? Hold on, hold on. I got a better one, Marcellus. Uh, <laughs> Could any of your coaches identify you in a police lineup? <laughs> any of your professors? <laughs> Anybody? You ain't study they identify you. <laughs> hey, <Damn>. man. <laughs> We're criminals up here. So I'm not going to stand up here today and just let you do this to American people, Jason. Get Look, it. man. I, had, I got off to a slow start in college. A slow start, but I finished College wrong. ain't the start. <laughs> slow, <laughs> slow's start. the right word. Yeah, right. Slow, we getting in the right direction. That's like the end of studying, like If college. Gilbert Godfrey was here, he'd say, you're definitely slow. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, we're talking about football yes. knowledge. Yes, Julie. Football knowledge. Yes, Julie. Smartest man in football. Yeah. Okay, let me tell you what the smartest man in football did back in 1998. <laughs> mm. This smartest man in football went around Kansas City in 1998 saying that the Kansas City Chiefs was going to go undefeated. Mm, that ain't happening. That was the year that they went seven and nine. <laughs> <laughs> that was the year that the Kansas City Chiefs played the Denver Broncos and made a damn fool of themselves on Monday night. Oh, yeah. Back to back, Denver Broncos. Following that year, Marty Schottenheimer was fired. Yeah, I remember. Hey, man. You. So, whoa, 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 whoa. So, we said, <laughs> up and talking about check the foot facts. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody better check the damn brain cells <laughs> of Jason Whitlock before he ruined another Kansas City season. Ooh, you got huh? another? You got some more? He's the smartest man in football. Give it to him. Where? In a strip club dressing room some damn way? <laughs> 
hell. Hey, man. Oh, he is on your Now, I'm going to tell you who's one of the dumbest men in football. <laughs> one of the dumbest men in football is your boy, <laughs> Stephen A. Smith. <laughs> oh. Man, if you don't call over to ESPN <laughs> right damn now <laughs> and tell Stephen A. Smith <laughs> what happened? that Kellen Winslow <laughs> and Derek Thomas ain't in the lineup tonight. Uh -oh. <laughs> Man, Stephen A's football knowledge done went wherever the hell his hairline done went. <laughs> we all make mistakes. Wait a minute, and now he's sitting up here with this dumb ass look on his face. You know, like, because <laughs> he know he got to go take that drug test. <laughs> Why? That's so now they think you on the weed. <laughs> Hey, man, we got 20 seconds. Hey, we got to go. You can't have that beat Patrick like Mahomes, that. Patrick Mahomes, oh, a total of 78. I got him in a total of 78. We got 10 seconds left. What can left. he do to be a goat? He's 86, <laughs> man. He's perfect, except he hadn't played oh, man, long I'm enough. Sorry, man. Perfect. Oh, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs>